Kelly Jones. I am the chair of African American and African Diaspora Studies here at Columbia University, and I'm welcoming you this evening. And this is a program we have tonight, uh, the Mellon Arts Dialogues. It's part of our Mellon Arts Project, and that is a project centering the arts in African American Studies. Uh, we've had artists in residence like Jason Moran, Micheline Thomas, international visiting professors such as Salim Washington and uh, this year Mabala Sumaharo from France, and also a postdoctoral fellow Jonah Mixon Webster. And dialogues like these, so uh, which are conversations between our distinguished faculty and celebrated black artists of various disciplines, from musicians to visual artists, filmmakers to choreographers. We celebrate black artists as thought leaders and culture makers, um, and we get a chance to hear from them about their creative processes, challenges, and goals. So I will now introduce to Melo Musaka, who is our Mellon Arts Project Director, making sure all of these things uh, take place that I just mentioned. And um, I will see you on the other side, but I welcome to Mello, and thanks for coming this evening. Good evening. Um, it's so wonderful to be here tonight, um, this is also our first public program, um, uh, which is, uh, we've been in the works for the last maybe two years. And so it gives me great pleasure to see faces in real life and to be in conversation with you all. You know, I think um, one of the pleasures I have uh, with, with the Mellon Arts Project is that uh, we really get to hear and learn from artists in terms of uh, understanding more deeply how they process and how they engage the community through their works. And so I think, you know, tonight we have two very special special guests who um, I've admired for a long time, whose work is continues to shift our thinking. Um, you know, our, um, to begin with, um, I will introduce Okwi. Um, Okwi Okpokwasili. I don't know if I've said it correctly. <laughs> you know, okay, okay, yeah, you know, born and bred in the Bronx, but um, currently living in Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh you know, you know, and I if you haven't seen her work, I would recommend you do because um, she is best known for her experimental work, which shifts between performance, theater, visual arts, uh, and installations. And so I think she is sort of treading this territory that, you know, sometimes some people feel is sacrilegious, uh, but I think what is exciting about her work is really thinking through how black bodies engage with oral histories, but also the memory of, you know, what black bodies have been known to be. And I think, you know, for me, having followed her work for a long time, um, it's really encouraging to see how, you know, through her practice, she's not only challenging uh, the way in which we think about the body, but it's just also challenging the medium. It's about how the body becomes a vehicle, but the medium shifts and changes given the, 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 the subject at hand. And so, you know, she has obviously um, received a lot of attention and um, has, you know, received such um, awards such as the Bessie Award as well as the MacArthur Genius Fellowship among many others. I'm not gonna, uh, you know, belabor the accomplishments that she has, but I will say that she is definitely somebody who is on the forefront of thinking about 
not only the body, but thinking about what does it mean to register a body in a particular time and place. You know, how do we respond to the ways in which we relate to bodies in space? And so um, I think we, I, I, will, I, will, I will move on a little bit and also introduce our, you know, our conversant who is, you know, Sadia, Dr. Sadia Hartman, who is a professor here at Columbia in the English and Comparative Literature Department. I mean, I can go on forever about her accomplishments, and I'm sure many of you know her accomplishments, but I will say that, you know, she is an author, and among the many books that she's published, I would say that, um, you know, currently the, uh, the scenes of subjection, terror, slavery, and self-making in the 19th century America, which is it's on its 25th edition, just recently released, I guess. And also, obviously, you know, the more known uh, Lose Your Mother, uh, a journey along the Atlantic slave route, and of course, not to mention wayward lives, beautiful experiments, intimate histories of social upheaval. I mean, among many other essays that she's written, I think these are really two extremely amazing individuals that I think we all can learn from. With that, I would like to introduce our speakers for tonight to the stage. Thank you. I think I want to begin where, um, you know, with kind of some of Tumala's remarks, and that is about the range of the work and the many spaces um, in which you work. I mean, you are working across performance, theater, dance, installation, song, film. Yeah. And um, so basically, I want to ask a theoretical and practical question at the same time, and that's about um, what is your notion of performance that enables you to work so widely and across all of these spaces? And, you know, I say like, oh, I thought I actually knew something about performance. I had written books, Scenes of Subjection. That Which I had read. <laughs> had said something about performance, yes. but my own understanding of performance has um, really deepened through the course of my conversations and collaborations um, with Oakley. Mm -hmm. So so really, what is this what is this concept of performance that you um, are working with that enables such a uh, an extensive range of practice? Wow, that makes me blush a bit. Um, because I read Saidia's um, scenes of subjection. Yeah, can we do something about the levels of the mic? Because it's very odd. Um, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you, you, we didn't test because I was late. I apologize. Um, and I was thinking, you know, in reading your book, you were articulating um, some of the ways that I was feeling um, my meaning as a black woman, African, African-American woman, when I would be on stage or when I would receive information from what might be largely white audience, audiences, the way they would react to my body or the assumptions that they would make about my body. And um, your book was helping me language or put language to um, the ways in which um, there was a kind of capturing that I could not, there, that I couldn't resist. Um, uh, within a legacy of, um, you know, post-chattel slavery, or let's just say we're still in the wake of that, and also colonialism. Like, how was my body um, something to either fear or to want to consume, and to or to use? And and I also, <laughs> and even within that um, understanding this sort of transactional relationship and the way that a black, my black body would be read on stage, I always also imagined that there could be another way of having a kind of communion. Was there a way to sort of, is there a way to move beyond this transactional nature? Is there a way to um, undermine, go around, behind uh, the assumptions that people would make when they would see me on stage? And I realized that there were a number of strategies that had to be <clears throat> employed. And 
some of them, uh, most of them, it always for me begins with duration. And I feel like across media, there are ways to sort of demand a particular attention for a certain amount of time um, that start to unmoor people from the positions that they, they started with or they came in with, um, or they retreat or they get bored or they get lost. Um, but, but I think that I have this, that sort of a driving desire to think about what are the potential ways that we can become entangled and also see or feel beyond um, the, the first reading. And I also have to say that um, I have a really, my collaborative partner, who is now my husband, is Peter Bourne, and he is deeply, deeply um, instrumental. I shouldn't say instrumental. I mean, he's, a, he's my deep collaborator, yeah. you know? We fight, we argue, um, but I think he has also an understanding and a desire of um, what the potential relation, like what is a relationship that can be shaped or where can we design a container for an evolving relationship across multiple media. And, um, and then, you know, I think sometimes I, I don't always think too hard about, oh, what genre or what space are we located in? It's sometimes, it's a mix of opportunities. Someone says, hey, here is a space, because we know that the theater can be, the theater world can be super confining, right? If, if any of you know, I mean, there's a Columbia drama school here, and the framework for making theater is often, you get four weeks, you know, of like rehearsal, and then you do the show, you know? And I, and I'm, so there are ways in which there isn't room for question, possibility. There's certainly not room for duration. You have to kind of get what you need done within a certain framework of time. Um, and so sometimes if someone invites you into a gallery space or another performance space, then you find you have, it's like, okay, now that I'm here, and I, I, I you know, what are the, what's the container that I want to shape, you know? Like, what is the relationship that I want to design with the people that come into the room that's outside of a proscenium, that's outside of all of those strictures of, um, you know, a subscription house or what people expect when they walk into a theater and they expect to walk out with a certain amount of information um, enough to have a decent conversation over dinner and cocktails afterwards. You know what I mean? And I'm not interested in that. And I feel that there are certain spaces where you can just keep pushing and pushing and pushing relationship with audience, time spent in the space. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going on and on, but... I'm going to come yeah. in and ask yeah. you know, some um, follow-ups about that. And I guess one is about what the durational um, makes possible and what the performative space makes possible. I mean, I think like you really thinking about the centrality of performance as a modality that is um, dealing with articulated and marked by these histories of racial violence and coloniality. So there's this inextricable relationship between not only the black body but the black performing body yes. with these histories of violence and pain. And I, I think the thing that you really helped me clarify when um, I think that my own conception of performance was trying to push against a certain model of performance that's always about a certain kind of closure or working through or redress or people imagine that, oh, there's the performative practice. And of course, that redress then is also articulated on another level, like, you know, social revolution, radical mm. transformation. But what you do so, you know, beautifully in your work is that the performance space that's the domain of the pain, but it's also the domain of the practice. Yes. And it's not that that practice affords something like no. redress or overcoming, Sorry. But, there, but, but there's a way of like inhabiting and being and working. And actually, my own notion you know, of redress has been re-kind of calibrated by that because it's like, oh, what is redress? It's just how the broken body moves, mm, mm. you know? It's like, it's all of that marking, it's all of the history that's assaulting that, you know, um, that sentient being, that marked flesh, and yet there's a, a making and a doing 
and an opening that happens there. I mean, I think of the durational character, you know, specifically about pushing again against the confines of the theater, but it seems that the durational character is also a way to address this, not only just the long history, but the multiple temporalities of your work. Mm. And I mean, I was gonna ask later about this new set of performances that are a part of, <laughs> um, you know, uh, Adoku's Revolt. Adaku, yeah. Adaku's mm -hmm. Revolt is mm -hmm. one. Um, heading from that, where you're moving, um, you know, thinking about histories of the transatlantic slave trade and coloniality, but yet there's also like a speculative and future, you know, this yes. kind of um, uh, futurism yes. that's also um, in the piece, the durational gets to the kind of the structural and ongoing character of violence. Yes. And I'm gonna add a third thing that's the question. And it seems that the durational is also related to what you've articulated as um, an intention for you or a hope. Um, earlier you articulated this um, as one of the, your intentions of performance is to create this open pathway where a performer and a viewer or people in a room or a space have this openness to a mutual embodiment and attunement so yes, that's what I say, that's yeah. what I hope and could that I don't know that that is even acts as redress but it's um it's a, just another kind of design of of relation but I but it's true I I wasn't talking about the fact that I'm I'm always writing texts so that's where it begins and I think um but can I say another design yeah. of relation wow that's actually a huge thing when you're talking about an audience coming in with an expectation of having an instrumental relationship to a black body or a black performer. So even to recalibrate that. I think duration helps. Yeah, it, Because it people are radical. like, if I can't get out of here. <laughs> like, like, some people are kind of like, if this doesn't end, oh my gosh. And they either stay in this space of like, <laughs> You know, because it's almost like they can't even watch it after a while. So you either, like, resist it and resist it, and then you have to deal with your own body's resistance, or you give in and something happens. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to predict it. But, you know, and you can't predict it, but it is. It's kind of like there. you have to encounter your own body in relationship to the bodies that are there. And so, you know... I'm, you know, I'm re reaching an age where maybe I won't be able to do that anymore. I'm gonna, where I'll have to find other means to do it, or I'll have to ask other people to do it who are my friends. Um, and, but, but so back to this, um, it's true that there is something about duration that also, when I'm thinking about the inexorable kind of um, entanglement in time, it's like our, our, you know, what is it also? If we think about, if I'm thinking about the texts that I'm writing as something that, um, as a, a black woman in a particular, in a post-colonial, or I mean, is it we're still in a colonial context? I think um, in this kind of in an anti-black kind of white supremacist misogynistic um, kind of uh, like shape of sort of our rela of social uh, sociality, right in the West, like there's a way in which it feels like I cannot escape that, right? And so there is something in the duration that speaks to the inability to actually leave one's context. Mm -hmm. um, and can we try and try and try? And it's interesting because I kind of encountered duration really for the first time when I was studying this, um, these, these, this, this Bouteau in Japan, and I spent some time on the, a body weather farm with Min Tanaka, and so there was a lot of duration there, but also, and body weather refers to the weathering of the body in relationship to, like, the earth or the, the water and the ground, the space. And so um, we were thinking about, you know, we weren't so consumed with a, spe a relationship in, you know, the human species, but what is it to encounter all of these things? Um, so in this, this new piece that I have been struggling to write, and, and I made a durational song first. I started to think about an epic. Uh, uh, um, um, I've been thinking about what happens to, say, a girl in the present who uh, 
her hair has been, um, she got it over straightened, you know, Brazilian, you know, hot, hot, like relaxer, you know, super straight, <laughs> lost all of her hair, right? And, um, and then in an encounter with a houseless woman in the touch of the head, grows back what's more like antenna that starts to um, connect her to a broken lineage in a pre-colonial West African uh, village of my imagining. And so I started to, so I made this song that is about this girl being unmoored from time and kind of going back and in this memory um, sort of needing help to handle what happens, because we're always thinking about, I want to remember, I wish we could remember, but but what happens when you have the weight of memory? What happens when you have the weight of somebody, you know, a memory of the hold or somebody being taken from their village and the memory of the grief of the people who are left behind? Um, and so I am trying to, so, so even though some of my research is in um, Igbo culture and what was happening before uh, colonialism and you know a love of facts like the British considered the Evo um, quite feminine and, and, un, and unruly because the, the structures were so democratic there was no king through which they could sort of implement their rule and so it actually took them longer to colonize the southeast and uh, so I you know there are little things like that and so I'm making this this world that is trying to, you know, it's a narrative that is the beginning of the broken link. What, what happened to entangle these people in this trade? And so it is, it is a narrative, it's, I don't, how much should I say? So I'm, so, so, so it's happening in these multiple iterations, right? So there's a song and you're in the space, so we've sang the song we sang it at Venice. We've sung it in, in, in different galleries. And people come in, and the song is about an hour long. I don't know what people grasp. But there's, de there's also, so her going back in time, she's also going back into the bodies of the people in those times. And so there is, there's a section of like weeping and wailing. And there are multiple voices. And, and so I feel that. I am now working on and about to premiere a piece that is kind of part one, where we're dealing with the first part of this narrative of this this speculative village, where the first um, where the first link is broken. So I'm I'm working on that, but I've been building this this song and and singing it with four people, and uh, uh, you know because I've been thinking of, I've also been thinking about the chorus and. What is it to not have one voice, but multiple voices? What if there is a space in the future where it isn't one singular person, like we refer to each other, we're, we're multiples, we're twos and threes and fours. So I'm, I'm just playing with these things, and, um, but still in the performance space, really concerned with not necessarily transmitting that narrative in a way that can be, you know, that is, what super legible, but I, it's like I understand that I want a kind of whirlpool. I want a sense of water being swept in a tide, um, and it's it's the water of time, but it's also space. And so, so sometimes you know I I'm again that 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 relationship in live space in the moment. Where can we? How can we? spin together in that. So I get really, um, and I have a partner who is amazing at designing and helping to design the soundscapes and the, the, spatial, the spatial world and the lighting world because he understands that what it is that we're trying to do is, is have this all-consuming, encompassing entanglement. That's just, you just don't know when you're going to come out of it. Because in a way, I don't know when I'm coming out of it. Like my my desire to somehow imagine, to, my my I'm grounded in this body in in um, my parents and what I've known in the Bronx in some ideas of Nigeria and being Igbo specifically. But but I'm 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 in I'm my body is 
entangled in the violence and the fear and and so I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going off. I, I, I have you know, two questions. Um, I think one gets to um, duration. And for those of you who um, haven't had the pleasure of seeing. Um, the pleasure of the pain. Yeah, the, the pleasure of the pleasure pain. Or the I, displeasure. I, I think I saw, I was, it was the third time I had seen Bronx Gothic. I can't believe and, this woman saw that piece three times. And, um, <laughs> and, and it was a kind of London version of it. And I just, I was, I entered the space um, and I just thought, and Okui had been performing for 30 minutes before things in a way kind of begin. begin yeah. And she's spent and the dress she's wearing is totally soaked with sweat. And I was just like, she's mad. <laughs> like, why would you why would start, you do that? like, just push yourself to that limit and then begin this? And, and so the power of that, though, um, was really formidable for you, yeah. your madness and yeah, the, and the yeah. power of that. And I guess partly. Didn't you say, why would you do, why do you do that? I was like, wow. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was just the kind why of, there was a that? courage and fierceness about starting off with an audience in such an incredibly vulnerable, open place, right? And it's not that you're in that open place with a kind of naivete. You're in this openness with an awareness of, it is by design. Yep. Appropriation, all of that. So it's by design. But um, I mean, I think I, I wanted to say, like, I think what the durational also does is it radically decenters the audience. I mean, you you speak often of the invitation mm -hmm. for them to be in a kind of an attunement with you, for them to be grounded in their own embodied experience. But there's also this weird thing, like, oh wait. The performance started before I arrived. Yeah. And then in Venice, it's like, OK, you are leaving, and I'm still in yeah. Yeah. I'm still in this. And so that's, that's a kind of radical disorientation, because what we're, we're invited into a practice. It's not like, oh, here's a performance that's rolled out for you. So I think in terms of you know, um, just recalibrating the experience of consumption and reception and power and authority. That's what the durational yes. does. Um, I mean, I think with the new work, I don't think one experiences it as narrative. Okay, I'll, I'll just. Um, I think that. Um, well, I've been working on it. No, 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 but, no, no. But this is a this is a compliment. I think because there, there's a way like I've seen. Maybe I've seen several pieces of what is the yeah. whole, and how exactly it's woven together is still elusive. And I think that that's because there's such a really complex texture to the piece. But what I did want to ask is about the kind of constituent elements of your performance, mm. because um, it's not that your songs or lyrics or narrative, and often there's like, really strange, weird lines, like, <laughs> you are ripping off my clothes. Or so, you were, I mean, not that, but <laughs> sure, they're stuff. But yeah, they're, they're just like, so there are things that, oh, like, if you're actually trying to like focus on that as a point of legibility yeah. or expression, you're, it, it's not going to. Well, I think there was a lot, especially in, so, in the, it, it, <laughs> so, <laughs> this idea of hair as antenna, we were looking at Ojikere's prints of um, uh, the West African threading style, which when, Koyo, when I met you, you had this style. I was raised with this style. It's very, very, I don't know if you have all seen it. It's like parts of the hair are threaded. Sometimes they're separate, but sometimes they're put together in a crown. And so I was interested in kind of a sculptural piece that was sort of influenced and reflected that. And so my husband and I designed a piece where actually you have it's like an, a massive sculptural object that people are wearing, and there are mirrors, and uh, and which you know mirrors and glass kind of can capture, collect, reflect spirit. Um, but the, so the song is happening, but then there's this sculptural piece. There's a lot happening, so I think it's hard to. And then there's you know there are a lot of pieces, and I think yes, there is the design to have. And you know you walk in, and you're 
in this thing. And so you're not necessarily going to step back and say, oh, right, that lyric, even though the lyrics are quite, um, they're really clear, but there's a, a lot to listen to in the in the space, right? If we register listening to with you know with all of our senses, right? There are these lights and mirrors and reflections and moments where a face is disappearing and um, but it, and maybe you can talk more about the relationship of elements in your practice. Like I mean, um, in one. Um, you know, you, uh, I think it was in the solo version of like a Poor People's TV Room. Yes, your, Poor People's TV Room solo, yes. Yeah, where you're, um, you know, um, involved in um, certain kind of like formal uh, dance moves that also have like a history, yes. right? But then you're also involved in a gestural language of your own. And um, there's the kind of the text from which every yes. performance <laughs> Yes. starts, and yes. then there's the element, there's the sonic um, space that Peter Bourne helps yes. you create, and then there's song, and then so there's, there's yeah, right, there's the sculptural piece the sculptural, that I'm within, yeah. And then there's the embodied movement. So I guess I yes. wanted to just ask you about text and idea. So text and always starts first. I, cause there's something, I can hear myself reflected in the, but there's, there's, the text always starts first. And so with Poor People's TV Room Solo, so of course I have to say that as somebody who was raised in this country, raised in the Bronx, and doesn't even really speak the Igbo language. You know, I can say things like, you know, Michonu, shut your mouth, you know, Michozo, shut the door. I can say, how are you? But I can't really carry on a conversation. And so there are, and so my parents came here at a time when um, the Biafran War was happening, but there was a way in which, when they came to this country, recognized that they were black, were very concerned about our English and how we would speak. And, and, and so there's a, a piece that I, there's a piece that I long for that is 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 missing. Um, there's a piece that uh, is missing from my parents when I started to talk to them about a sort of what was what was a practice of your ancestors before you know Episcopalianism, Anglicanism, and they can't remember. You know, so there are all of these ways in which I'm constantly um, looking looking for some clue or some sense of something that came before as a way to imagine something coming um, in the future, right? Some imagined future. And so the pieces that I've been working on recently are kind of constantly looking back. And Poor People's TV Room started with um, research that I was doing into um, these reports that uh, uh, the British commissioned after women rioted, supposedly in 1929. They called it the Abba Women's Riots of 1929, when in fact, the women, the Igbo women called it the women's war, right? Because they were organizing to um, have their voices heard to undermine the British colonial government. So I was really interested in um, looking at that time period. Um, 55 women were killed during that war riots, as the British called it. And there were these commissioned reports that the British colonial government had written to find out, well, what happened? What did we do wrong? And I was just really, so I was reading the reports, that there's a book of uh, sections of these reports, and so I wrote a song based on some of the language that was coming out of these reports, my speculation about who they were uh, while reading the reports and doing some other research, and so this was also a long, long song, and that, that started as I was writing that song, then I started to think about gestural work, and I started to look at some videos that I had taken of um, women's groups dancing in different festivals. So I was like, kind of grabbing some of the the movement from also the older ladies who were dancing, because I was sort of I wanted to do something that I know when we look at African dance, particularly what I've seen in this country, when people say African dance, it's quite you know it's. Um, you know, it's quite you know this. And when I'm when I'm in you know when I'm with African women dancing or in the places where I've seen African women dancing at weddings and houses, da 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 da. It's much more you know it's 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 much quieter, right? And so so I was taking some of these things. So yes, it all began. It's always beginning with my desire to recover something. So then I write a text, and the text came from those women. 
or this idea of the women because it was mediated by these reports. So, you know, and there were translations. So there's also still a gap between what I know of the women, what I think their voices are, and what they actually were. So I'm always trying to like, I'm, tr I'm just in those gaps. I'm just being in those gaps and then speculating, right? And we talk, you talk about critical fabulation. You are, you know, and so I think that I'm constantly trying. I mean, and, and I can't maybe footnote. I, I'm not as I'm not the his, you know I'm not the researcher that you are. And I'm not going to note it all. You know, um, I, I, I don't. I just I take these things and I'm just I'm I'm moving in in the gaps, and then in that little gap, then I'm trying to make this. Then I'm trying to make a bigger space, right? Maybe it's a, it's a bigger something. I'm just trying to move, move in this tight space and open it and open it and open it. Not so that we know what happened or know who people were, because I don't know that I can do that. But somehow we can be, we can just, we can be in this, not I don't want to say a mantra, but a, in, I don't know, what is, so, you're trying to you're trying to find out well what's the method to all of this madness right and I I I really I don't maybe it's the time also that I spend in a studio in that duration and I find okay this is the movement I'm staying with this movement when I stay in this movement you know I'm I'm nicely in that gap and it's opening it's opening it's opening I don't and I, don't and, I know. Love and then I videotape it and I then mean, I, look I love and I seeing say, that mm. relation in the Poor People's TV Room solo because yeah. it was, you know, it was like, oh, this is my performance archive that I'm working with, but I'm working it to a difference. And yeah. so that echo and that distinction was very lovely. Do and I, I should, yeah, I should and I should explain questions? Poor People's TV yeah. Room solo. So, like I said, that was a big explanation for it. But what ends up happening was. Um, there was a box in which I used to, I would be doing this song. And I'm sorry, I don't have images. I think I should have, whatever. Um, <laughs> so, so, um, so within this box, there, it was four-sided and it was elevated about six feet off of the ground. Four, but it was covered in a kind of um, slightly translucent plastic. And then there were images uh, there was a box, there was a, a, a small kind of screen on the bottom of the box, and there were images flashed from a collage of Nollywood films that my husband had put together that were forming the light in the box. And then we had two videos, uh, projections of um, outside of the box of um, uh, the women dancing in my parents' home village, uh, of also close ups of some of the, the most sort of um, uh, emotionally wrought moments in a Nollywood film, a, a house burning, um, and, and some young women dancing. And I was borrowing some movements from them. And so, so that's happening. The song that I built based on these commissioned reports is going. And that is kind of a mantra where I'm taking some of the language that I think is the, yes, mediated language, but language that supposedly comes from the mouths of these women, and then adding my own. And the song itself is just, it's, it's about, it's, it's also an insistence on recognizing the body, the body that's here. It's, you know, and some of the lyrics are, look at this body, you know, um, um, I suckled you to my breast, I did all of this. And one of the lines that I, I love is, is um, also a line eventually, like say 40, 50 minutes into the song is, I can't read your Bible, um, I, so I won't swear on your Bible. I can't read your Bible. I will swear on a sword. I can read your sword. I will swear on a sword. So the idea is a woman, one of the women refused to swear on the Bible. She said, I'll swear on a sword. And, um, and then in the end, it's also like, and then, and then I say, um, so there are lyrics kind of moving, the lyrics of the song it's long, but it takes you from recognize this body, see all that this body has given, now what, see what you do to this body, now I'm coming for you. So that's kind of, <laughs> if you stay with the song, you'll realize that's what's happening. And, all, and then there are, all of these, there are all of these other images that are thrusting you back into a Nigeria that is 
of a, a village, an ostensibly true moment, even though it's a festival moment, and, um, and then Nollywood, which to me is another, it's like a Nigeria, but a, a sort of cultural fabrication, a way in which um, Nigerian people are not buying Hollywood mil films, they're making their own kind of, you know, they're, they're making their own cultural, pop cultural artifacts. Um, playing themselves to themselves, but still kind of within a framework that feels very Western anyway, um, but also other, if you guys have seen Nollywood films, especially the old ones from the 90s and early 2000s, they're the most ist. Um, so, and, uh, and so there are all of these, yes, and then there's me in, in the box, and, I, and the, the, the speed of the song is such that I actually had a spit box because if I was to keep up with the rhythm of the song, I couldn't actually swallow. So I would just be like drooling, but no one could really see because of the translucent plastic. And at the end, I would break out, uh, I would cut open the plastic. But then, because of COVID, we were trying to capture it and hold it. So I was no longer in the box, but my husband made a sculpture that was raffia and it was moving. And so there was a sense of some movement in the box. I made a video of some of my movement, which was projected onto the translucent plastic. And so, yes, there were so many layers of a ghost present, a, re a remembering of, you know, a, is there a body in there or not? Um, it, it, yes, there were. <laughs> there are many elements that go into this, and it just makes sense once we're there. But we have to be there. Like I have to be in the moment of the research. I have to be in the moment of making the song, doing the song. I have to be. You know what I mean? Like there, it's. And then it's like I have to argue with my husband, and then, and I'm thinking, but what about this video or? I, yeah, that's a lot. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna help you, idea. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. I, I, I don't help you. I never help. Like um, I. Like how does it all? It just. It just. It, it's. It's like. No, this, no. I mean, I, I understand. Yeah, you it's like let you know. You can't. It's like the secret of the sauce. You know. It's like okay. Yeah. You can't. Like you know. Um, or but it's the layering. It's, the, it's, the secret of the sauce is the layering. Yes. Right? You gotta start with the onions, you, you know what I mean? You gotta, or maybe you do the, the meat first, you take that out, put the onions in that, and then you go, you know, maybe it's a layer, it's a layer, it's a layer. But all the while, no, I'm being stupid because I'm, I'm tired and my stomach hurts. Um, and that's not any of your concern. I don't know why I said that, but my stomach is starting to hurt. Because maybe I'm, because it's the swirl, but the, it's the swirl, right? I do feel like my body, something has to be at stake for my body in order to be in a space where maybe something is at stake for the bodies of the people who are there witnessing. Maybe, and maybe not, because I think people also leave. They retreat, and they're not interested. And, and I would say that um, there's a kind of um, complexity, or I would say sometimes I would say indifference on your part <laughs> as well. And I guess I wanted to ask. Because I'm doing the work. I'm but, not indifferent. Not indifference. It's not. A, it's like I can only be concerned with so much. No, and it's like, and so that's I what try. I mean. It's like I'm gonna just leave this to you. Yes. You come or not. Yes, come I can't force you. Or not. Mm -hmm. And so I guess um, you know, thinking also about um, incompleteness is another value yes. uh, for the work. Slowness. But I, w I was gonna um, ask you about something that maybe I would describe as. Ritual, and it was like you working with a text, um, uh, which it was just like I would just say it's a text of primary sound. When I saw you in the open studio, mm -hmm. um, the open rehearsal at MoMA, and then you were working with uh, Sin Sinitra and Samita, Sa yeah, Samita, yeah. Samita, and those Bengali folk songs, and just the circle yeah. of dancers. So that's not a project. I mean, at that, that part that of point. the pro project, yeah. right. So, so what is that? Because that was like the before, and I could have lived in that before for four hours. Yeah, like it was such wonderful. an intense. So I'm always also working with incredible collaborators. I'm always, I, I feel like the community is so, so rich. And when we ask people in, I, you know, I'm, I'm learning from them. But there was a sense of, again, if, if I'm imagining 
um, some way of being that is not one, but is two, three, four. Like, what is the way that the bodies are doing that? And it's not a Cirque du Soleil kind of way, but what if we're, you know, holding, um, what if there is a particular rhythm, a particular beat that we're sustaining, and then we sustain that with each other just for, like, what does it mean to sustain that? I think that also speaks to community. I think that also speaks to, um, like, what, you know, do we strive for that? Do, do, we come up, do, do we come apart in that? How do we come back together? Or does it suggest, like, this is actually what we do as human beings. We're sustaining this pulse and this rhythm and some of it is sometimes it's too much for us, and we, you know what I mean. But but we're all in this in kind of entanglement, and whether we, you know, we kind of cannot refuse it. Um, and so yeah, so with these with these women, we were holding. I wanted us to think of um, like a, there's a a pulse to to our togetherness. There's a pulse to this language, and if I'm going to imagine this world, there's a there's a pulse to this world, and and. And, and we can't stop. We, we can't stop. And I, and I think it, it calibrated those who were in the room because that rhythm was so, so, so powerful. I'm going to ask a last Sorry. question now. And this is where you're many. And I, so if someone were going to produce a text for you, <laughs> and you said, OK, I'm just going to write a text <laughs> for Oakley. What, what's, what's I in, really want to say this. Anyway, go ahead. No, no, so, so, what is this, so what do you want in it? What, oh do you, what, what are the things you want in it? I, I don't know that I would um, ask, if someone wanted to produce a text for me, I wouldn't necessarily at, let, uh, tell them what I wanted in it, because I'm already doing what I want in my texts. So I'd be interested to see, what do you want to offer? What are you curious about, you know, how I would manage a thing? Right, right. But it I also do acting stuff. I still do that random stuff. I know, stuff. but but when I, I like it, right? But when I see Sometimes. you, and this is you know, this is not <laughs> you speaking as an actor. But when I see you in a kind of a a more traditional stage production, yes. yeah, is it you, weird? It's so weird. <laughs> it's so weird, and you seem. It just seems like oh, this is too small and tight a space. You yeah. know, it's just like that. Um, the sense That's of That's why I'll never get cast again. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, but um, so much, you know, it's, I think that what I love is there's the, the open moment of the unfolding of the work and what happens in that and the way people are positioned in it. And it's just like, oh wait, how did I wind up being calibrated by some by dancer yeah. and feeling like I'm just like moving in a line in a radically different you know, manner than which I entered this space. And for me, that's just like, there's so much power in that. So what I'm just kind of watching you as a performer on a discreet stage with a show that has a distinct telos, it just feels radically restricted. Yeah. So. That's interesting, yeah. I think that's another part of my practice, which is sometimes, which is submitting to other people's language and like thinking about other people's practices. Um, because I can't escape mine, yeah. you know. And yeah, other people have, are very clear about um, what they want it to look like, sound like. They're so, even though I can be, I can have some clarity around that, but um, I, I, I want the mystery and the magic. And I think, uh, I do, I want, I want the ritual, I want to be a witch. Right. I, I think that's, that's what it comes down to. You want to be a rich and I'm incompleteness a is a kind of like an ethical value of yes. the work. Yes, I mean, because yeah. it's, it's what, cause you say incompleteness. Does that the same thing as unfinished, unending? Mm -hmm. because, I mean, it, because, it's yeah. this, because we're not finished until we're dead. And even then, I don't know that we're finished. Yeah. Like yeah. we're some other thing. But maybe I do. I think I want to be a witch. I think that's what it all comes down to. All right. So that's should we it. let others yeah. into the space of conversation with us? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Sadia. <laughs> no. I'm such an idiot. No, not <laughs> <laughs> So we have a few minutes for uh, a few questions. So if anybody has some dying questions, um, we've had such a wonderful conversation, oh, so I'm okay. sure. Yeah. I'm a hopeful person. Blessings. Thank Blessings. you so much for this conversation. It's so amazing. 
I also got the profound opportunity to see you in London in your show. Yes. And I just remember you was doing that work. Yes. We came in and, you know, I was kind of um, similar to this idea, like, oh my God. And then like 20 minutes in, I was like, is she good? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? And then it was like, it got to 30 and then like the light came on and I was like, you couldn't have done it any other way. Mm -hmm. Because in order to tell that story, that's where you had to start. Uh, yes. Um, yes. So I shade your process, Maybe. you know. Yeah. So you talk beautifully about duration, which I think is dope. <laughs> Can you, and I think a little bit of what Saidi is saying about the theatrical space being small, right? Because sometimes in these shows, as we are in New York, um, it, it isn't any stakes, let's just tell the truth, yeah. right? It is, it is an institutionalized space. And so can you talk a little bit about how you kind of approach the works of others where you have to repeat the per performances over and over and over again? Yeah. I feel like what is kind of like your practice around repetition? I, and how do you kind of hold your practice of improvisation, mm -hmm. right, which is always an emergent practice yeah. inside of a space that is wanting to replicate and really institutionalize itself? Mm -hmm over and over and over for the consumption of audiences on a Broadway stage. Like, right. how do you well, tend first, with those two I have two to say, things. I'm a lover of repetition. Okay, good, speak I'm a, to I'm that. a lover of repetition, because okay. I think in repetition, there's never necessarily the same. There's infinite variability in mm -hmm. repetition. And so, like, Bronx Gothic is a written piece. Some people think, oh, she improvises it. I'm like, no, I wrote it, memorized it, and I, do, I don't change the language. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel like I, I like a container, um, you know, it's like, you know, I saw a no performer in Japan and they're doing like these ancient, like these, these dances that they don't change anything. They've been the same for thousands and thousands of years, right? But, but there is a way in which they inhabit that vessel and it, it's, it's a different breath each time, right? It's a different breath with, e and so I feel that way about perf performance and doing other people's performances. But you are right that the culture in this country, and particularly Broadway, of um, mass production and actually using up uh, the energy of the of actors and the bodies. I mean, it's it's a it's a model that says, you know, six days a week, you know, eight shows a week. We're gonna just we're gonna we're trying to make something that's plastic, repeatable, never changing. We even have people who will sub or swing in for folks and we have to make sure their performances are exactly the same. It's absolutely, it is kind of mind numbing and, and there's a, there's, there can be, there can feel like a lack of liveness in it, but that is the practice of those performers, right? To sort of go in it even though you're doing the same thing and you know what the next thing is, to, but kind of meet it every time mm -hmm. as if it was new to you. But, but the larger system that enslaves people or, and, and that, you know, and, 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 and then you're giving all of this energy and you're, you're, uh, you're living, you're giving every ounce of sweat and body to it, but if you can't get people in the seats, it's, it's done, nobody cares, right? And no one cares also if maybe you're not a celebrity. So there's a way in which even that labor is, is, is just devalued. And, um, and the nature of the labor, it, it, you know, if, if, you're, if you're doing Harry Potter and people are filling the seats, it's going to continue. But if you're doing, say I was doing For Color Girls, and maybe people weren't coming to see For Color Girls, you know what I mean? It's just, I don't, I don't care how, how much this means to say, especially there were like young black girls who would come and they would be like, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know what I mean? There, there was a, there was a and it, it was happening in the same theater that the original production happened in, you know, in 77 or 78, I think it was. And so, and it's historic because it was the first um, black woman director, choreographer on Broadway, or maybe the second in its history. Like there were all of these ways in which there was a kind of, um, you know, there was, there was so much, um, I, you know, what, what would you say? I don't, like, meaning, value, mm -hmm. history. 
in that production, but it, you know, no, who cares if you can't fill the seats, right? And so that's, that's Broadway. So that's not necessarily my, that's not my, uh, that's not my dream or my goal. However, it's also something that supports a lot of, if you can get in a show, you can make a living wage in New York. You can maybe sustain yourself for a little while, get some health benefits and all of that. But, but sometimes there is also that sense of you play, on a broader, you play on a broader stage on a bigger scale and more and more people can maybe experience a shift in ideas and change, you know, but, but it isn't something that I'm not interested in helping those people shift. Do you know what I mean? I, 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 have, I have my work, but I still, I do think that there are people, like Saidea is doing a project with um, another good friend of mine, Charlotte Brathwaite, and there are a number of people involved, and I don't know if it'll be theater, film, you know what I mean, but I just want to make sure that there's a way in which I want to be in conversation with others and not just in my own space. Am I answering your question, Erin? Yes. I mean, it's still a really problematic model, and especially it's problematic if you call that model culture and not car- commerce in the market, which is, which is a distinction. But I still think there are people doing valuable work, and, um, and I do give praise to all of the, the performers who show up and, and, and sweat and, 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 and work and try, mm-hmm. you know. Thank you. It works? Okay. Thank you. I'm so grateful uh, for this fascinating exchange. And uh, I have to say that I love your work and I love the work of Sejia Ortman. So I'm so grateful to be here today. And um, so I'm not American, so I'm French and I have, you know, uh, North African origins. Uh, My family comes from Algeria. And so the the question of body is so important to us, especially in this context of Islamophobia in France, in the context of police violence. So I was wondering, do you think that, um, that the body can be a space of reparation? especially in your work of uh, performance, you know, of dance. And I say that because I think that our bodies, you know, contain the traces of memories, the traces of trauma, uh, the traces um, of discriminations, of slavery, of colonialism. So how can we repair thanks to our body? Well, that's, I feel like Saidia was addressing that. Could you ad- address that also when you're talking about okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's for me like the question, and I think that um, there's always a qualified answer, right? Because oh no, there's not. Um, <laughs> Which one? The <laughs> <laughs> meal. Um, and um, you know uh, because there is. Um, you know, and of course it, it's not like that these kind of structures or violence are still ongoing and creating, um, you know, new forms of violation, but yet there is this care work, there is the way, um, you know, the broken body still moves. And I think that it's important to really, um, to recognize that that work that's done, and also to recognize the radical limits of what can be done, yeah. right? So it's not the, um, you know, some transcendent cultural yeah. practice that can, you know, make us better under racial capitalism, because you know what? We're just never going to be good under racial capitalism. Yeah. So let's not imagine that the space of performance is going to make us, you know, good. But yeah. there is a kind of an attending to um, and an address that's very um, important. And I have a story, it's somewhat of a joke, but you know, uh, Feldenkrais, they have this saying, and I, I always thought it was like very white. And it was like, why dance when you can walk? I was like, who says that? <laughs> why, you know, why you know, dance when you can walk? Um, but when I was in um, Sitting on a Man's Head, Moving through that space, walking, I was like, oh, because when you're like 
embodied and present in that way, walking is dance. Like yeah. everything that was required in walking, I discovered. Yeah. In, and so, and that's kind of like that moment of redress. Oh, it's a kind of a calibration. It's an attention to, it's a regarding, it's this attunement with others. There are these people who are guiding me. And again, it's like, you know, I stepped out into the structure of the world that hadn't changed, but I experienced this very intense transport. Yes. And I think that's what... I think, so yeah. I, my husband and I, we designed uh, an installation also where, and, and a shared experience, we had other artists who were also... Um, they were liaisons, and we made a space where people would walk very slowly and sound together. But before they entered into that space, they would answer some questions as to what do you carry, how in turn does that carry you, um, what do you imagine happens after death, do you, if you imagine there is uh, an afterlife. Um, and uh, there was another question about, have you ever been accused of something that you didn't do? Have you ever accused someone else of something you didn't do? So we had these intimate spaces where people would have these conversations and then come into the space in a slow walk, um, hopefully in some way reflecting on what those answers were, what that conversation was, maybe having built some sort of bond with the person they were having a conversation with. But it was a slow, sonic, Yes, and, and it, 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 was, um, it, was, it was quite lovely, and we've done iterations of that, again, with the uh, idea of attuning to each other and the possibilities of not reparation, but um, yes, maybe it's a, recalibra a recalibration, a redesign. But I'm sometimes interested in the wound. I'm interested because the inescapable wound and that the, there's like a little... I feel like somewhere in that wound, if we imagine it's just like the sea of, of, like, um, of really uh, glaring red, and, but somewhere in there, there's like a stone, something cool inside. Like if, 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 if the wound is like this lava, and then there's like this, but then there's some cool stone inside, and it's like, I kind of want to get through that lava, and I want to kind of be with that stone. You know what I mean? So I don't want to escape the wound, I don't want to transcend it. I want to see if, if I can keep going, 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 I can get to something that is with it and is still, like you said, sort of moving, moving. I don't know. It's, um, yeah. Yes, sorry. Okay. It's no, no, so much. it's okay. <laughs> go on, and I want to thank Okwe and Saidia yeah, for being thanks. here today and all of you for joining us and thank you all. Thanks to our team, Sharon Harris, Sean Mendoza, James Jennings, Joshua Agabata, Chloe Powers, Olivia Pearson. And join us next week at the Schomburg Center on April 19th at 6.30. We'll be doing a conversation with curators, with Lowry Sims, Deborah Willis, Ashley James from the Guggenheim, and Kalia Brooks uh, from Next Haven, and myself, and Tumelo Mosaka. So join us next week as well. And thank you all. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you.